Thank you so much for sharing your lecture with us, Dr. Salvatore. At this time, we will open the floor for any questions. So you can submit your questions through that Q&A feature. And we have a few in there already. So I will throw out the first one. Is NTM infectious? Should they get an antibiotic? It's a complicated course. A lot of patients that have um, uh, MAI infections are not treated unless they are symptomatic or progressing on radiology. It's ubiquitous in, in the environment, so um, we don't always um, treat it. What is the difference between NTM and MAI? They are synonymous. They are uh, alternative terms used. How much air trapping is normal on expiratory CT scan? Mm. I, um, I divide the lung into four quadrants, and I accept that if it's in one, um, one quadrant, I call it um, normal. And when I see it in two quadrants, I call it mild. If I see three quadrants, I call it moderate and four severe, just so that I say the same thing um, when, I see this, uh, when I see a CT scan so that I can be um, consistent. Thank you. What is the definition of traction bronchiectasis? Okay, so traction bronchiectasis is when we see, usually in the periphery of the lung, we don't see the bronchi. So that when the bronchi become visible in the periphery of the lung, um, we call it traction bronchiectasis. It's really quite interesting why that would uh, occur um, when the alveoli collapse in the periphery of the lung, it pulls open the bronchus, giving traction bronchiectasis, and it's associated with um, fibrotic lung diseases. I often see reports of bronchiectasis called. When you look, the dilation is only mild relative to the pulmonary vessel, and often on follow-up, the dilation is no longer there. Any recommendations on how to tell that the dilation is bronchiectasis or transient? Mm. That's a very good point. Otherwise, we're going to be overcalling bronchiectasis. The pulmonologist waits till it's 1.5 times the size of the pulmonary artery, but in radiology, we say bigger than the pulmonary artery for our definition. I guess we would have to retract the diagnosis if it became normal on the follow-up imaging. But by our criteria, if it's bigger on the CT scan, I would call it bronchiectasis, even if it's um, mildly larger. I think an interesting thing too is sometimes it's not that the bronchus is bigger, but the bronchus wall is thickened, which may make the patient have obstructive lung physiology. I think both things are interesting to, are important to report on the CT scan but I differentiate bronchial wall thickening from a bronchus that has normal wall thickness and is bigger than its accompanying artery. The definition of bronchiectasis is permanent dilation of bronchi. Why is there then a reversal of dilation on treatment? Um, only with um, the treatment now that they're, we're, it's new to us to be treating cystic fibrosis and seeing improvement of the size of the bronchus. This is relatively rare, maybe the definition needs to be um, changed in the future to include reversible dilatation, which would help with the other problem that we had on one CT scan where the bronchus was bigger than the artery and on the second one, it was not bigger. So we could say bronchiectasis on one study versus another, but for now it's considered irreversible by definition. Are the stages of sarcoidosis established based on x-rays or CT scans? Thank you for all these questions. On x-ray, they were initially established, but because um, I think that we can apply those to CT scan because we can see the same things even more on CT scan. When we see um, fibrosis in the upper lobes on a chest x-ray, and instead of, um, and it pulls out from the hilum, that's very characteristic of sarcoid, especially if there's tenting of the hemidiaphragm which indicates volume loss of the upper lobes. In contrast to tuberculosis pulls the hilum, superior sarcoid pulls the hilum out. So although they are based on chest X-ray initially, now that CT is available, we can apply those, um, the grading to the CT scan. Is there any benefit of low-dose CT to characterize bronchiectasis? Yes, I think we should be moving to low-dose CT scan um, and, and, and to MRI. You know, we used to use... Uh, when you've been doing this for long enough, we used to use the highest possible dose to make the most beautiful picture. And the pendulum has absolutely swung to using the lowest possible dose to see what we need to see. And I think um, the follow-up for that will then be going to MRI. And if we can see that the airway dilated, there's no reason not to use the lowest dose possible, which um, 
I think that lung cancer screening has shown us that we can see dilated bronchi with a dose of less than three milligray. What is the normal thickness of the bronchial wall? It's barely perceptible. I, I tell my residents that um, if you can measure it, it's probably thickened. I don't think the cursor allows you to measure it when it is normal, but if you can measure it, I find that it it is thickened to my eye, which has been looking at it for a long time. So I would just say that. So if you can measure it, it is probably thickened. In a case where we have middle, super, and lower low bronchiectasis, what may be the origin? So I guess common things happen commonly. And when I see bronchiectasis in all the lobes, it's oftentimes a very bad case of MAI. Um, as diseases advance, the, early, the, the best way to make a diagnosis is the earliest CT scan where the disease, where it starts. Um, and by the end, all types of bronchiectasis, all types of fibrosis can look, have a lot of overlap because there's so much extensive disease. Um, so because common things happen like commonly, it's usually MAI. But any disease in its end stages can have bronchiectasis more extensively in all lobes. How do you differentiate cystic bronchiectasis from cavitory lesions of lung parenchyma on CT? Mm, that would be very difficult, right? You're going to have to rely on um, coronal images and sagittal images to try to reconstruct the um, the path to the central trachea, and sometimes that path is just is um, is lost, is truncated. I think um, cystic bronchiectasis is clustered and usually cavitary lesions are, are sing may, they may be multiple, but they're not necessarily touching each other. And I think that that might be a um, helpful way of doing it. I heard you say you use aortopulmonary ratio to assess for pulmonary hypertension. What happens when the aorta is ectatic? In my institution, we use 29 millimeter as cutoff for main pulmonary artery. The literature says 29 millimeters is the upper limits of normal. But um, if I, I, heard, I read a paper that they used, they said that 33 millimeters was 95% confidence interval. So I went to 33 millimeters. But I still think um, it's very hard to measure that exactly, depending on the position of the, the patient's pulmonary artery. And I'm much more confident when the pulmonary artery is bigger than the aorta to call it pulmonary artery hypertension. I might suggest it at 33. I don't do it at 29 um, millimeters. I wait till 33 to be more confident. I, I, I make that higher. Can you have very small focal bronchial dilations? So very small bronchial dilatations. What a delightful question too. Um, the secondary pulmonary lobule is the functional unit of the lung. It's shaped like a hexagon and the bronchus is in the middle of it. In the earliest, so the bronchus we normally don't see, so it's very, very tiny in size. When the patient has, oh, it's so interesting with, we'll take, for example, um, UIP, usual interstitial pneumonitis. The patient's alveolar epithelial type 1 cells stop working. The type 2 cells take over the function of the type 1 cells. The type 2 cells make surfactant, so there's no surfactant to keep the alveoli open. The alveoli start to collapse. If all the alveoli are collapsing, they pull open the bronchus. Now the bronchus is three millimeters in size. It's not supposed to be three millimeters in size, so that's the smallest little bronchi being dilated. When I see that, I know the patient must have um, fibrosis occurring when it's three millimeter in size. Over time, as it gets more and more dilated from more and more atelectasis, the bronchus takes up the whole secondary pulmonary lobule and becomes 10 millimeters in size, a dilated bronchus, 10 millimeters in size. And the secondary pulmonary lobule here and the secondary pulmonary lobule here are touching each other. These two 10 millimeter size cystic structures, which are the airways now are dilated, touching each other, we call that honeycombing. Last question, please explain Williams Campbell. Williams Campbell is um, a, a congenital disease with absence of the cartilage that affects the a specific part of the airway from the fifth to the eighth branch where there is no um, no cartilage. So we have ballooning out of the bronchus, and when the patient expires, they collapse. So they're short of breath because they're air trapping. So when you see this ant mini type of appearance, where the central airways, where the trachea and the the proximal airways are normal and the peripheral airways are normal, but the middle ones are dilated, it's likely Williams-Campbell and they're going to do genetic testing to prove that.